I wanna cover some of the latest accident statistics and hopefully provide a practical conversation of the safety of general aviation. There's a really helpful report published by the AOPA that used to be called the NAL Report, and it's since been renamed to the McSpadden Report in honor of Richard McSpadden. There's a link to this report down in the description, and it contains data as recent as 2023, but then they do a deeper dive on the data and publish a more full report on the findings, and that report lags a few years. So I want to walk through some of that here and focus on non-commercial fixed wing operations. The first thing to notice here is that the majority of general aviation accidents are not fatal. From 2011 to 2020, the fatality rate averaged about 17.5%. So it's not an automatic assumption that if you're involved in a general aviation accident, you are going to die. And I don't mean to be blunt or insensitive, but I think these stats actually show the opposite, where the overwhelming majority of GA accidents are survivable. And I think that's a helpful thing to keep in mind as we jump in. Scrolling down, you'll see the accidents per 100,000 flight hours, which is worth taking with a bit of a grain of salt because they really have to estimate that number of flight hours, but it comes out to about five accidents and 0.8 fatal accidents per 100,000 flight hours. And that figure has been trending downward over the years. Now, whether you think that's high or it's low, I I think the bigger question to ask here is what caused those accidents and are they within your control or is it like taking a lottery ticket every time you fly and just hoping that your number doesn't get called? Well, first of all, it says in the report that roughly 70% of accidents were pilot related, 17% were mechanical, and the small remainder were other or unclassified, which AOPA says are accidents that cannot be classified into a meaningful phase of flight but were reasonably inferred based on preliminary data. It says that as more NTSB data comes in, these flights get recategorized into their respective areas. So we have some really good data on the 70% and the 17%. So let's first dig into the 70% of accidents that were pilot related and see how much of that is theoretically within our control versus just pulling a lottery ticket. And then also look at the 17% mechanical and decide the same. If we scroll down to the major types of accidents, this is where things get more helpful as it shows us accidents and fatal accidents by phase of flight. So let's dive into a few of these that had a particularly high number of fatal accidents versus the rest. Descent and approach had the highest number here with 24 fatal accidents. If you scroll down, it will unpack that in more detail. And you can see that within the descent and approach category, stalls and spins were the highest fatal accident cause within this grouping. Broadly speaking, loss of control under 1000 AGL causes the most fatalities in aviation, and this is controllable. Collisions and deficient instrument approach procedures were next. Now, some collisions might have been outside the pilot's control, but still, we all have a role in that in terms of keeping our eyes outside the airplane and communicating well on the radio. So the largest fatality rate grouping, this descent and approach category, again, the causes are largely controllable, and it tells me you're not just playing the lottery. The next most fatal category was weather. If we look into this, VFR into instrument conditions is the number one culprit, which again is controllable by the pilot. Poor IFR technique is next, followed by icing. Being a proficient instrument pilot with very conservative decision making can help keep you safe in this area. The next category is takeoff, where the most fatal subgroups were loss of control and stalls on takeoff. Weight and density altitude showed up on here too, which is the pilot's decision on how to load the airplane and when or when not to fly. Next is maneuvering, where the most fatal subgroup is stall or loss of control. For non-pilots or newer pilots, I understand that the thought of a stall might sound really intimidating or scary, but the truth is you practice these a lot in training and you learn to identify and feel when a stall is approaching and how to appropriately recover. Where they are most dangerous is at a thousand feet and below, where you might not have enough altitude to recover if a stall turns into a spin, but spins are avoidable with proper technique. And the more you fly, the more you can recognize stalls, anticipate stalls, and intervene before they become unsafe. In other words, stalls are not just a random occurrence, they are very much within the pilot's control. Next is fuel management, which definitely comes down to pilot control. Flight planning and systems operation cause the fatal accidents here. Now, I'm not trying to sound insensitive to any of these stats or invalidate anyone that says they have some proper reservations about flying. I'm not saying, you shouldn't worry about it. Look at the causes. That's not what I'm saying. I know that these represent real deaths and that is honestly tragic. What I do want to call out from these stats though, um, is that most aviation accidents are survivable by, by the numbers. And two, the, the accidents that, that weren't survivable, the overwhelming cause was either pilot error or pilot decision-making. So this tells me that of the things that should concern me about the safety of aviation, random events are way less likely to hurt me than my own decision-making will. I'll say that again because it's important. My own decision-making in the cockpit is way more likely to hurt me than random chance. 
And this is why things like the hazardous attitudes are so important. We learn them as a required part of the test and training, but how much do we really apply it in everyday life? I know I'm not immune to having these attitudes and they really can get me hurt. Statistically, they are the thing that will get me hurt. And so these stats are a sobering reminder to check my mindset before each flight. And I think it's also super helpful to reflect on practically how these accidents probably played out. If you take VFR, like flying VFR into instrument conditions, for example, it probably did not manifest itself like, hey, the airport is really socked in, I'm not instrument rated, let's just go for it. No, practically, it probably looked like, hey, I see a break in the clouds, or hey, that cloud layer is really thin, or something like that, where they were just able to push the envelope just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit, and before you know it, they were in a situation they never should have been in, but it didn't look like that big, obvious, let's go get ourselves in the soup in the first place. It was a series of small decisions. It's likely the same with stock all spins in the approach phase. It was probably a series of small decisions that maybe started with, hey, let's really slow the airplane down to make room for this other guy that's coming in as well. And then they accidentally overshoot the base to turn final. And before you know it, they're uncoordinated, they stall it, turns into a spin, and the rest is history. It probably wasn't just a, oh my gosh, all of a sudden we're out of control. It was a series of small steps that probably got them there in the first place. In my experience, I have found that safety slips in small stages. I didn't intentionally coin that phrase, but it has alliteration and it's memorable and I kind of now live by it. I put out a video a while back talking about a time where I got in the mountains and I was way too high, way too fast on approach that I felt really committed to in Idaho and it really freaked me out. And it wasn't just all of a sudden I was there. It was a series of small decisions. I was trying to get in front of some other guys. I was really just trying to get out of their way and I didn't see the airport soon enough and therefore my approach was high and I was coming in too fast and there was density altitude in the mountains and before you know it, you can't slow down, you're too high and you're in a bad spot. And it's a perfect example of how safety for me, it slipped in small stages. It wasn't any one decision that got me into a bad spot, it was a series of small ones. So I think when you look at this data set, it's really important not to just judge the outcome, but probably also remember the practical application of it and how it happened in the first place, because I think that can help you be more conservative in the cockpit to realize I'm probably not gonna get hurt by some big, hairy, obvious decision that I shouldn't make. It's probably gonna be me pushing the limits a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Before you know it, I'm in a spot that I don't wanna be in. So for that 70% or so of accidents that were pilot related, the overwhelming cause was pilot error and decision making. And it's largely avoidable. It tells me I'm not just pulling a lottery ticket each time I fly, but that I have a tremendous amount of responsibility in each flight. Basically, it tells me to double down on my own decision-making and safety because statistically, I am the reason that I would get hurt. But what about that 17% or so that were mechanical in nature? The data in the AOPA report here shows that most fatalities were from power plant issues, followed by fuel systems and airframe. That kind of begs the question though, what caused the power plant issues? And was that kind of a random chance scenario or again, is it within our control? Well, AV Web did an awesome video a while back talking about why engines quit. Now, frankly, I won't try to recreate because it was just really well done. I'll link it down in the description if you wanna watch the whole thing. But the takeaway from their data was that a very small portion of fatal accidents were from engines quitting. But furthermore, when you look at the reasons engines quit in the first place, 50% or more were pilot or maintenance caused, such as fuel issues like starvation or exhaustion, which made up about 30% of the 50%. Random failures were less than 20%. Now, unfortunately, about 30% of the causes are unknown, but this could also be caused by things like carburetor icing that don't get reported because by the time they inspect the airplane at the scene of the incident, the ice was gone and the engine starts right up and it's listed as unknown. The headline here is that even with engine issues, the vast majority of it is preventable with pilot decision-making and taking great care of the airplane from a maintenance perspective. Anytime you hear about aviation accidents, there are some incredibly important points you need to remember. Number one is that aviation accidents are largely survivable. Number two is that fatal accidents are largely due to pilot error and decision-making, not random chance. Number three is that the safety of each flight starts over every single flight. Basically yesterday's decision-making, yesterday's safe flights, last year's safe flights, none of that matters except for today because statistically I am my biggest hazard. And so we really need to check our hazardous, hazardous attitudes every time we get in the cockpit and realize that safety starts over with every single flight. Number four is to remember that safety slips in small stages. Be aware of the little decisions we're making that could add up to a bad situation. Number five is accept what is in your control and that which isn't. Basically to me, I'm willing to accept
accept what risk is within my control. And statistically, that's the majority of it. And I'm okay accepting the stuff that's outside of my control. And if you think about it, we do the same thing with cars. We wanna you know, accept our own responsibility, try not to text and drive, certainly don't drink and drive or anything like that. But there's a lot of risk that's actually outside of our control. There's other drunk drivers. There's lots of people texting and driving, eating cheeseburgers, talking on the phone at the same time as they're driving 80 next to you on the highway. But for most of us watching, it's worth it to us because we want to live a life with cars involved. So similarly for me in aviation, it's worth it to me for a life flying if I can accept what is within my control and take that really seriously and then be okay with that which is outside of my control. Now, please don't hear me invalidating you if you have valid concerns about aviation, either you flying or a loved one flying, but I do think there, there might be an overemphasis on aviation crashes. There are so many channels that exclusively talk about aviation incidents, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. In fact, I think most of the time it's a really good thing and it's really healthy to have resources like this where we can learn and try to become safer pilots. But I do wonder if sometimes people might, not the channels themselves, but those watching, if we can overemphasize where we just look at the headlines saying, oh, there's an aviation crash, there's a plane crash, plane crash, plane crash, where we start building up in our mind and think that the boogeyman is out to get us, that this is just random chance that inevitably it's going to happen to me or a loved one at some point just by the numbers. But I really wanted to make this video to try to uncover the stats to help us realize like what are really the, what, what are the reasons that airplanes crash? What is statistically most likely to get me hurt? So I don't want to invalidate you, but I do want to encourage you with the reality and the context of the situation. Now, a very practical way to focus on the safety of every single flight is actually on the drive to the airport. I put a video together talking about what's kind of become a ritual for me that I really believe has helped me get into a safer mindset before I ever get into the cockpit. So I will see you in that video.